Welcome back to our latest episode of Japan's top business interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, the president of Dale Kani Training, Tokyo, Japan. My special guest today is an old friend of mine, Darren McKellen, who is the regional head for Z Scaler. Welcome, Darren. Welcome. Great. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's、uh, discussion. Yeah, well, that's right. It's going to be a conversation. And, you know,、uh, you've been here quite a while in Japan. How many years altogether now?、Uh, a little more than 30 years. Right. Okay. That's serious. 30 years. Yeah. So, what brought you to Japan in the first place? Sure. So,、uh, in my life, I, I was always interested in, in international affairs, international things. My, in my university years, I spent、uh, two terms in Sweden, one term in Mexico. And at that time, in the late 80s,、uh, all the economists were predicting that Japan. Was going to take over the world. The Japanese economy was going to be twice the size of the US economy. So I began to look towards Asia, towards、uh, China, Japan, Taiwan, and trying to figure out where I wanted to go. And Japan looked like a good fit. And I came here and I stayed. So. Well, 30 years ago, it would have been a good fit, I guess. You know? Yeah. So、uh, you choose Japan. And how do you get here? Did you find a job in the States that brought you here, or you just turned up here, or how did it work? I actually had two jobs when I came here. So I ended up getting a job at Kintetsu in Chicago, and it was a Kintetsu air cargo. So I was working with companies in the Midwest that were exporting to Japan. And my boss at the time had a brother who owned a trading company in Minami Aoyama. They got me a job, and then another guy in the company also got me a job teaching English out in Yamanashi. So I went to Yamanashi, taught English for a year, and then came to、uh, Minami Aoyama. I lived in Omote Sando. My office was Omote Sando. My、uh, apartment was Omote Sando for four years. So that was a, a real luxury. Yeah, right in the center of town. It's good. And so,、uh, how long before you moved job? How long were you in the trading company? I was there for four years. Four years. So, in that four years, were you running a team or you were basically your own entity? I, I, I was、uh, part of a team. And it was really interesting because one of the products they had were the Justin's, the school rings, college rings, university rings. So, I was in charge of going out to all the universities, including、um, all the women's universities, and setting up a big table of college rings. And then people would come up and buy them. Uh, this company also did the Super Bowl rings. So I, we made a, a, a Yokozuna ring for Akebono. We talked、oh. to the Yomiuri Giants、uh, about making a, a ring when they won the Japan Series. So it was kind of an interesting role where I was meeting a lot of young, young kids. I was in my 20s then, and also meeting a lot of these sports stars. And、um, basically, promoting Justin's rings was probably 80% of my, my job at the time. Okay. And so after those four years, what happens next? So then I had a, a failed、uh, business venture with Chrysler.、Uh, so Chrysler hired me、uh, to help them sell cars in Japan. And I wasn't a good fit. I, I lasted a little more than three months. I knew that the job wasn't for me. And what, what was the thing about the, was it the culture in Chrysler? Was it the. Sense of timing of how long's i t take in Japan for Chrysler and you? What was the, what was the thing that wasn't quite working there? Yeah, I, just I think everything. So, for example, <laughs>、um, I would ride my bike to work because、okay. I've been living in Japan and everyone there was American expat and they drove. And they said, Why is this guy riding a first? You know, there's these things that I was a Japan guy, they were like Detroit guys. And then. And they're also the, car guys. They were car guys. And the business culture was. Was horrible for me, where it was a very macho, top down culture where、mm-hmm. the VP would get mad and yell at the director, and he would get mad, and, and, and people would just be really mean to everyone all the way down the food chain. And that was the last job I had that wasn't in the IT world. <laughs> and so、um, what happened was after three months, I, I just, and I had just gotten married, and I told my wife, this isn't working, I wanna get out. And, and I thought, this is a great girl I married. She's like, yeah, get out. And most Japanese women would say, don't leave your job, we just got married. But she knew it, it wasn't working. I, I got a job offer from some company, like a trading company, for like 9 million yen. And Terry Lloyd, our friend, Terry Lloyd, offered me a job for like 4 million yen selling ads in Computing, magazine,、uh, Computing Japan magazine. And my wife said, take the job with Terry. And I said, again, Wait, you're a Japanese wife. We just got married. Don't you want the higher salary? She says, No, I know you want to get into the IT world. I know this is the right job for you. And it was, you know, because that's a, a key thing in life is you have to do what you love.、Mm-hmm. And so、um, I knew I really wanted to get into the IT world. This was the mid 90s. 
And um, I got in, and I had a lot of success there. Was that, it, that, what was, was that Japan? The Japan Inc. Japan Inc. magazine. Yeah, I remember that magazine. Yeah, it was a good magazine. It was very good, and I joined, and it was, it was just crazy because I joined, and three weeks after I joined, Terry's like, oh, my God, we got to sell ads or I'm going to close the magazine down. <laughs> I thought, what did I get myself into? And within um, two weeks, I, I ended up getting a, a double-page spread from Apple, and then Panache, another old yeah, friend, Paul, yeah. Goldsmith, Paul Goldsmith, they yeah. signed a year contract for a quarter page, like purple ad with color. And I brought these two ads in within a couple of days. And then suddenly I was a superstar yeah, in the are. company. And I was like, oh, Darren, help save the magazine. Yeah. And um, I don't know if it was an artificially uh, created crisis by Terry to get us to sell, but it worked. And um, from that point on, you know, I, 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 you know, from that point, Terry was in his 30s. The next three companies I worked for, the presidents were in their 30s. Uh -huh. And it was kind of an exciting time in Japan where mm -hmm. the Internet was coming. And we got it, but the Japanese still didn't Hadn't get got it. it and, yet. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. that that was uh, my last job outside the IT world was Chrysler. And then I and got was it easy to bridge out of Japan Inc., which is sort of in that world, into the IT industry? Because Did you have an IT background before? I, you I did not. And so uh, it was it easy. It, it became easy. The beautiful thing about Japan Inc. was I got to talk to every company in the marketplace. Nice. So everyone was, whether it was a big computer company or a startup internet company or, you know, one person show, I, so suddenly everyone in the whole marketplace knew me, mm. and that allowed me to get into more systems integration type work. Mm. Okay. And so what was the IT company you went to after Terry's shop? Uh, I, I went to a couple. The, the key one that was exciting was a company called Technovox, mm. and it was run by a Sri Lankan guy mm -hmm. who... Um, Took out a bunch of loans and grew the company quickly and didn't see the, the dot-com bubble about to burst. And he was pretty much a genius, but also um, kind of dreaming too big at times and, and kind of getting ahead of himself. But he had the idea that we were going to set up the first cloud hosting or the first, I guess, uh, server hosting farm in Japan, right. which we did. And he and uh, it was really the beginning of the cloud before there was the cloud. Yeah. And we did agreements with all these big companies. We grew the sales and then everything kind of blew up. But um, it was He's very prescient, was, though, in terms yeah. of way ahead of the game. right? Yeah. If I would have been I and I was just kind of along for the ride and it was shocking because we would go into these big banks for venture capital and they would say, well, you know, we value your entity twenty-five million or thirty-five million, and I'd be sitting in these meetings, just a really kind of a young guy that didn't know what's going on. Like, wow, they're really thinking. There's a future here. There's a lot of money to be made in this market. So that that was exciting. But that that blew up because of the dot-com, you know, bubble coming. And so I decided to join the biggest, safest telco in the world, which is WorldCom. And then they went bankrupt two years later because uh, they had a lot of funny stuff on their books. So that was uh, really a, a learning experience of kind of, um, you know, just, um, I guess, you know, scrambling. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, well, this company, that company, getting married and, you know, having kids and, and having these companies mm -hmm. coming and going. It was mm -hmm. uh, fun and stressful. Yeah. When did it sort of settle down for you? So the, the probably one of the biggest breaks I got in my life, and, and again, this, this could come into like the, the power of intention, but um, when things were at the height of the, the bubble crisis when no one was hiring, I made a list of as many companies as I could find in Japan that might want to hire me. Mm -hmm. And at the very top, I put Vodafone because hmm. they had just bought JPhone and I knew mobile was going to be hot and I wanted to get into the mobile world. And also, yeah, because it's a foreign company, I thought there might be a place they could use me. And so I targeted all 23 of these companies with that one at the top. And I really focused on it and did everything I could to get the interviews and get in. And I got in. Well done. And, yeah. And so, uh, um, you know, looking back, I think a lot of it was the power of intention and mm. just, you know, that's what I wanted. And if you want something mm. and you visualize it, then um, often you get it. So. Mm. And what was your role in Vodafone? Yeah, that I was. Uh, I set up the first enterprise sales team for product marketing. So, J Phone was the first phone to have a picture, a camera on it, mm -hmm. Mail. and mm -hmm. it was the phone for cute, cute phone for young girls, and they would mm -hmm. all take pictures. And in the enterprise space, you had KDDI and especially Docomo. Mm -hmm. And for the business guys, they were using Docomo phones. Mm -hmm. So Vodafone, which was enterprise power in Europe, mm -hmm. bought JPhone and said, we're going to have business solutions. 
and mm. we're going to have enterprise solutions. And they hired me and they set up a team and they gave me 10 guys to run this team. And what I, what I didn't know going in, well, well, first I knew I didn't know what I was doing because I had never been in product marketing. Um, I'd never been in the mobile world. Suddenly they said, you're getting a team of 10 guys. Have an experience of running 10 people as a Ooh. team. Yeah, I've done that once. Yeah, I've done that once in sales at Technovox. Um, but I wasn't, I still didn't have the experience. I had the um, energy and the enthusiasm to fire people up, but I didn't, you know, when crises would come along, I, at times I didn't really know what to do. And so uh, what happened to me at Vodafone was really amazing, was inside, inside you know, the JPhone company, nobody believed we could sell enterprise solutions. So in the product marketing team, they took the 10 probably least talented guys they had in the entire team and put them on my team. They, I had like eight guys who weren't talented and two young guys who were super talented but troublemakers and just wanted to make me look bad so they could get the credit. So, and then my boss, I had a meeting with my boss and he said, um, I only had one meeting with him and the first meeting was, I don't believe we should be doing enterprise solutions. It's not gonna work. I, they didn't ask me about this, I don't wanna do it. And that was the only meeting I had with him was him. So I, I, here I am, I don't have any experience, never been in the industry. I'm beginning to learn this team I have is, is, is not good. My boss doesn't talk to me, doesn't believe in what we're doing. And uh, it was actually a fabulous, uh, stressful, great, intense learning experience for me. And I got to fly to Europe like every other month. I was going to Reading or uh, Dusseldorf for all these different places, um, or else Stockholm, uh, Milan, all these meetings with Vodafone. So it was great. And then uh, my, my, my leaving was even better because um, <laughs> <laughs> Vodafone wanted to reduce their sales force, and so they had a voluntary retirement package. Mm -hmm. And the worst, the worst thing a foreign company can do is come to Japan and start firing staff. So they're like, all right, we're 4,000 employees. We want to be 2,500. We have a voluntary retirement program. And at my age, it was at that time, I got, 15, I got 18 months salary to leave. Oh. And I ended up, I worked in the company 18 months total. And to leave, they paid me 18 months. And one of the vendors that was selling to Vodafone hired me as the first employee to set up their operation here. So it was really uh, amazing. I, I, I go into this company, I learn about mobile technology, I learn a lot more about managing teams, I learn about product marketing. Um, and it's like after 18 months, they're like, great, you've graduated, here's your prize, here's another 18 month salary at whatever it is, the 5% tax, because it's this retirement tax. And um, for me, it was uh, just a great experience. And the, the, the but you talked about you talked about uh, you learned to manage teams, and they gave you the dud team that yeah. you know they can't fire these people. But oh, here's Darren, and we'll give them all to Darren. So, yeah. what did you learn about managing a team? Um, at that time, <laughs> well, yeah, you have to analyze the skill set for each person. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and who can handle what, who can do what. I think also um, at the time I didn't know that, you know, I, I, and, I, I, and since then I've received dud teams uh, in other companies and sometimes you have to get rid of people. And so at that time, JPhone is a very Japanese organization that weren't ready to do that. But um, I think, you know, keeping people around that don't produce doesn't help anyone. And it's actually a big risk to your company. And I've been in, 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 in later companies where one company, I, I won't mention, but we had a Japanese older man country manager and anyone who was bad at sales. So no, no, we're not going to get rid of them. We're going to put them in sales support or put them here, put them, put them there. And all the people we should have been getting rid of, he was keeping. And then the good people would leave through attrition. And by the time they fired that guy, we had a company of sub mediocre people that really hobbled the company for years and years and years. So I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to analyze the, the, the people and then either find a new, if they don't fit, find a new place in the organization, which is the best thing to do. Or When we say that, though, when you look around today, if you look at the market today, we've got massive declining population. Uh, I read some statistic the other day, I think it was Nick Smith, uh, the economist, he was saying that it's 880,000 people have come out of the workforce since COVID started. And what he's saying is that there's a big hole there that's hidden because of COVID. And a lot of people lost their jobs on the hospitality, tourism industry, et cetera. He says, once we get out of COVID, you're going to find that hole is there. And trying to actually get anybody 
you know, you've had a, in the last 20 years, I think it's the ages of 14 or 15 to 34, that whole band population has gone down by half. And so and for the next 40 odd years up to 2060, that's going to go down again by another half. So in, at some stages, you, yes, you could get rid of people and find people and get re, you know, re-energize the team. But what about today? You know, but you're, we'll get to Z Scaler in a moment in terms of if you had rapid pickup of teams. But for a lot of people, I think maybe they're hanging on to people because they know, well, we've trained these people. They may be the 80% who produce 20% of the results, yeah. you know, um, but we're going to have trouble replacing them if they go. Um, but we're just going to need bodies, you know. So I'm just wondering whether it, uh, an inflection point maybe for a lot of companies who won't be able to have that choice of just, okay, yeah. we've got to clean out the, the, the dead wood and uh, replace them. Well, actually replace them with what may become an issue. So, But we'll talk about Zscaler because you've grown the company incredibly fast, but we'll get to that. So sure. after this, um, this company, the, the most recent company you explained you went into is much better um, well, no, it wasn't much better. Actually, the president had a lot yeah. of Deadwood. What was the company after that that you said it was doing better? They had a, a better business plan. The one after, um, the one after, uh, after Japan Com, I think you oh, said. Japan Inc. Oh, uh, no, uh, after that, the phone company. After the phone company, you left the phone Verizon. company. What happened after? After so after Verizon, actually, actually after Verizon, I went to Oracle. Oracle, but, was it? But, okay. um, yeah. Yeah, so going on to, you know, holding on to people, I guess our, our business model where I'm in, in IT sales and cloud sales, uh, quality over quantity. So we don't need to hold on to that many people. It's more important for us to have the few quality. really, really good people. Mm. And so the yeah. way I get them is you have to sell the excitement. And I, I don't want to work for a company that's not dynamic. Luckily, mm. I'm in a company that's dynamic. So you, you, if you work at a hot company and then get that message across, people want to come. So mm. we, we, we're not. Well, let's talk about that in a moment. But sure. let's talk, talk to us about Oracle. I mean, you know, it's a legendary company. Uh, the president is a huge Japan fan. He's got a massive Japan garden and he's, he's got yeah. samurai armor and, you know, Japanese stuff throughout the house. He's a legend. So what was that like working in Oracle in Japan? Uh, that it, it was great. Um, you know, it's just a huge organization, and so it it really depends where you end up inside Oracle because it's so big. And they there's some products that just don't fit Japan, and if you get stuck in that vortex, it's really hard. And then other people have products that fit well. So someone, you know, when I joined, one of our you know mutual recruiter friends had a joke. He said, you know, Oracle's a great place to work if your name is Larry Ellison. And I thought that, that's, that's a great way to put that's it. That's a great way to put it. Okay. Yeah, because so I, I think one, one thing I learned about Oracle is um, they had these processes that hadn't been changed in 20 or 30 years, which was really bizarre to me. And I, I began to figure it out and that since the company had had so much success year after year, they never had to restructure. Mm. So some companies, they get in trouble and they're like, we got to rethink things and restructure. Mm. Where mm. Oracle was making money for decades and decades and decades. Mm. So, you know, getting approvals or various things, it'd be like, this seems really archaic. We, are, do we really do it this way? You know, it's like, oh, you want to change your quote? Okay, the sales guy has to go back and spend two days rebuilding everything. And it's like, well, wait, why does this guy have to kill his evening to uh, do a quote? So, so that, that was a bit weird. Some of the archaic, I guess, leftover things. What was your role there? What was your, what were so you doing? I was hired. Um, so when I joined Oracle, I was their head of the um, CGBU, Communications Global Business Unit, which is a, a group that Oracle buys a lot of companies. And they had bought a company called Techelec and a couple other companies. And they had these leading products that were like digital routers, digital gear in the network that we would sell to NTT, KDDI, SoftBank, these huge telcos. And what had happened is Oracle bought these leading companies, but since they had bought them, the competitors had really caught up. And some of the competitors were brutal because they were Japanese, like NEC or Fujitsu. Huawei was there. And, and, and so who was, a, you know, very inexpensive. So it was really, really hard to sell these products and I had this huge team and um, How many or, team? the greater team was 16 um, but the, my direct reports were six and that was when I learned how to 
the, you know, when you, when you have to get rid of people, how to do it because the team I inherited, you know, had just kind of grown organically and a lot of the people weren't very talented. And so how do you get rid of them? a lot of sympathy. And, um, I, so uh, it's really, um, I guess with empathy. So my boss at the time had fired hundreds of people and his, he's just like, get rid of people, get rid of these guys. The guy, and he doesn't want to hear about it. Right. So he's American. He was Dutch Dutch, okay. and he was sitting in Singapore and he was just, I don't care how you do it. Just get rid of these guys. But what I had learned was, um, it's stressful when people get put on a PIP program. So you put someone on a PIP program in Japan, you know, to improve. And if they don't pass, they have to leave. And so if I was thinking about all the problems these guys think about, it's like, oh my, I might lose my job. You know, my, I'm going to lose face with my family. I might not be able to pay for this, pay for that. So when they would come into the weekly meetings with HR and me, they were ready for like a battle. And I would be super friendly with them. And a lot of times I found these guys jobs inside Oracle. I'd look around and say, here's two other options. Have you thought about this group or that group? And what happened was it, it really helped them cooperate. So some of the people that had to leave, you know, they saw I was fighting for them, so they just signed the paper and they, they left. Other people took the job internally. One guy was really not very smart. I, I found him a job internally, a really good job in the cloud. And he's like, no, I don't want that job. I can't believe what this company's doing to me. I'll never work here again. And he left and he couldn't find a job and he got a job at a Chinese company and then he was gone from there. And, and so sometimes you, you got to put your pride aside. But I think um, really when you're sympathetic with people that have to leave and you, you can, they can see that you're genuinely trying to help them and help, you know, help them find new roles inside. So uh, otherwise it, it can just get ugly and it's not very pleasant. So um, what happened at Oracle was we had this huge team. We had a product that was hard to sell. And my boss, the Dutch guy, uh, instead of saying, Darren, the sales numbers are low, you're doing a bad job, he really analyzed things and said, you're doing a good job, but this is a product that's hard to sell in Japan. So look for something new in Oracle. And so he supported me well, which was good. And at that time, Oracle had bought a, a really hot cloud company called NetSuite that Larry Ellison was an early investor in, actually, doing cloud ERP. And a lot of people wanted that role, but I really wanted it. And um, we Intentional. went through, I really, really wanted this role. And I, I got the HR people in Oracle to be my champion and give me inside information and all these different people support me. I found out who all the decision makers were, who all the important people were. And I got, and they actually, the, uh, NetSuite put it up to a vote and outside Japan, it was like 50, 50 between me and a Japanese guy. And then there were three Japanese guys that interviewed both of us. And everyone in Oracle thought that three Japanese guys are going to vote for the Japanese guy to be their manager. And I had a 30-minute interview with them. And the thing that really swayed them is I, I told them, I'm positive. And I, I see that this team needs positivity. And they're like, we want to hire, we want Darren. So the ja I remember I, I heard later at the, the, the board meeting and said, guess what? The Japanese guys want to vote for the foreign guy. And so I, I got the job. And that was like a dream come true. Another really challenging job. But to, to work in the cloud and learn how important the cloud is and how the cloud can scale and what the cloud can do and how, you know, you have one instance globally where you can manage everything. Uh, how, many, how many people in your team? So at that time, the company, well, so I was, my direct reports were only the salespeople. But the team was around 26 people at that time because we had a lot of delivery people. So I had five salespeople. And one was a troublemaker. And when you say a troublemaker, what, what do yes. you mean? What, is, so, what sort of troublemaker? Yeah, he was a troublemaker that he would fight. He would openly fight with people in the office and get into arguments and disrupt the entire office. He knew how to game the system so he would get all the good leads himself and let, have the other people starve. And he was actually mean to his own. We went out to dinner, I think it was with PC, PwC or one of these companies, and he was really mean to some of our own staff, like really belittling them in, in front of our partners. And Is this someone who, and I'm, you know, I'm wondering here, is working in an American company with quite a different culture around survival and getting ahead? And is he sort of absorbed some of the worst elements, do you think, of the foreign culture? Yeah. Or is he just a nasty piece of business anyway? He, 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 it was his personality, but also he learned how to, I think in some aggressive Western companies, he probably 
was allowed to get away with that. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, at that time, my philosophy was very different from my boss's philosophy, where my boss was like, okay, this guy's a closer, we're gonna hire him. I don't care, I don't care if he's trouble, you manage that, that's your job. Where my point of view is, all right, we have a team, we're building a new team, we're gonna be getting rid of people and rebuilding this, we gotta hire team players, because one guy can mess up the entire team. So actually, I, I, I ended up getting that guy to quit within three weeks. Oh, well done, yeah. how did you manage that? It, uh, <laughs> So he, we were in a sales meeting and he just started fighting with another guy, like shouting at each other. And so I said- Which is very unusual Very unusual. In Japan, right? like, yeah, what? and you know? what happened was this guy, you know, because it was my first month, this troublemaker guy was in charge of the forecast uh, for the first month. And so one of the other guys put a huge deal in the forecast at the, and then took it out right at the end of the forecast. So the one month he's in charge of the forecast, like it goes foom, foom. And it, it, it wasn't a big deal because he was temporarily doing it, but it, it was a, a stupid thing for this other guy to do. And he starts screaming at the guy. So I told, I said, everybody leave the room. And I met everybody, but the guy that was getting yelled at stayed in the room. And as soon as everyone left and it was just those two, they stood up and were just shouting at each other. And I was like, okay, you leave the room. And I was there with the troublemaker guy. And I said, this is unacceptable. There's no more fighting in here. You're not allowed to fight. This is a new, new office, new company, no more fighting. No, 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 but this guy messed up the fork. Blah, 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 blah. You gotta discipline him. You don't know how to manage. You gotta, no, 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 there's no fighting. And he didn't understand. And I went up to the whiteboard and I, I wrote really big drama, D-R-A-M, I said, no more drama, no more fighting. You're not allowed to fight. There's no more fighting in this office. And I have zero tolerance for fighting. And I walked out of the room. And later that day in the office, I, I happened to catch his eye. And he had this look of fear. This really, it was weird, look of fear. He called in sick for three days. And then he came in and said, I'm going to resign. And since he was our number one producer, I think he thought I was going to say, no, let's talk about it. And he said, I want to resign. I said, uh, okay, to make this official, can you please go back to your desk and write me an email and put it so we have this in writing now? And he went back and put it in writing and resigned. And um, I remember the, a lot of the senior management was like, oh my God, congratulations, how did you get that done? So how, how are we gonna get rid of this guy? <laughs> Except the head guy was kind of angry. He's like, you lost your number one producer, you know? So he, from his idea- The, the head guy being- uh, well, the, 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 My boss who was- Is in he, another country. Yeah, Australia. Managing this from- Yeah, remote, managing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And has so no he, idea what the hell's going on on the team. Uh, he, well, he kind of knew what was going on in the team, but he, he just, his philosophy was very different from mine. So I, I like teamwork and he's like, get, get, get producers. And then you manage the producers where I'm like, let's get a, a team where everyone, especially in Japan, because people love teamwork, you know? And so one, one as, as you know, you know, you can have, you know, 10 great workers. You put in one guy who's a troublemaker and the productivity of everyone goes, goes down. down. Yeah. So the motivation goes down. The cooperation goes yeah. down. The bitching goes up. Right. So, so what happened there was, so I, the sales team, and there's another guy who wasn't very good, and I, you know, tried to help him out, and he let, we're still good friends, he left and went to Salesforce and has a great career now. And so the company was around 26, we went from five salespeople to three, I hired, I hired eight people in less than two months. Wow, well done. Seven of them succeeded, one of them didn't succeed. That's not bad, that's it pretty was good great. ratio. Yeah, it's hard to hire ratio. fast, and, and, and then I was able to recruit out of Oracle, which was good too. And then uh, when I left, we were around 23 salespeople and almost 80 people total. And so, was it Harmony and Light after that? You yeah, it, the, was, it was incredible. It was great. And the, the results showed that? that it was incredible. The results, up. we went, I mean, the, the four quarters, I think it was um, 27%, 54%, 107%, and then 183%. And um, it was going well, nice. but again... Uh, you know, a lot of the people overseas put that all down to the um, the corporate culture. And they had this idea that, wow, well, if this if this kind of crazy gaijin guy can get these results, well, if we hire a real Japanese manager, it's going to be even better and things are going to take off more. So I could see that they were uh, kind of planning that it might, you know, there could be other options. And then, you know, in life, that... It, it worked out perfectly because the Zscaler role was right there waiting for me. And that, that's how it is a lot, a lot of times. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. 
All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. A lot of times too, you know, in big organizations, there are um, westernized Japanese yeah. who are also ambitious looking yeah. at you yeah. and saying, oh, I should have that guy's job because I'm Japanese and uh, I'll do a better job than him. Yeah. So you've always got that in those big organizations, a sort of a com very competitive undercurrent there, even people in different sections looking over in your section thinking, well, I could do that, maybe right. better than him. So it's not easy in a big organization. Yes. And so there's always a balance. And sometimes it's good. I think, um, you know, you need a Japanese. You see some companies, they have a, a Western leader and then they go to a Japanese leader and sometimes they swing back and forth. And so... Um, it's rare, you know, the, the company I'm at now, we have a, a, a great leader. He understands the Silicon Valley way very, very well as a Japanese Well, tell guy. us about Zscale. I mean, sure. probably many people don't know the name. And what do you do and what's your role there and, you know, how many people? And uh, you, I know you're hiring fast. Tell us, talk us through that as well. Sure. So um, when I was at NetSuite then, I, I, I saw Zscaler. Someone tipped me off. They said Zscaler is looking for a country manager. And I knew one of the guys I knew well who had worked with twice before was one of the four employees in Zscaler. And I called him up and had a chat with him. And I, I said, what is Zscaler? <laughs> it's four years ago. And he's, oh, we do security. And right away I thought, oh, security. I'm not, because security, it's always, um, I'd seen too many security companies sell on fear. You know, if you don't, if you don't buy our stuff to lock the back door, the bad guys are going to get in, you're going to get fired. And, and so, um, but when I took a close look at Zscaler, it's a cloud company. And we're a lot more like Salesforce.com or NetSuite or Workday or ServiceNow. We're a pure cloud company. And so I guess the elevator pitch at a high level is all the corporate data now is moving to the cloud. People are using Amazon AWS. They're using Salesforce. They're using Microsoft 0365. So when the data moves to the cloud, the security needs to move to the cloud. And that's what Zscaler does. We have all of our security in the cloud. So you get authenticated in the cloud and checked and go directly to your application instead of having to route all the way back to some firewall sitting at a data center. So it's actually revolutionary. It's, it's genius. And when I saw it, I thought, oh my God, this is a hot company. And um, so I went through the interview process and they had never thought about hiring a foreigner and they had interviewed 23 Japanese people before and all, rejected all of them for whatever reason. But How long had uh, Zscala been in the country? Um, well, they had had a partner here for quite a few years, a really good company in, uh, of all places, Megadoku, called Nox, N-O-X, and they had closed a few deals. But we had reopened the office, or opened the office in 2017, hired two people, 2018 hired two people, and then January 2019, I was employee number five. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. And right. a year so later. So right into the start, really, actually. Yeah. 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 After the IPO, but just right after. And um, a very successful IPO, probably the most successful IPO in 2018 when, in retrospect, because the company is now the market cap is $40 billion. And at Whoa. the time was okay. $3 billion. I think Not when bad. I joined, it was like 4 or $5 billion. And so... Um, the market believes in us, and uh, we're growing quickly. So, and you're you're successful in hiring people. You told me you've gone. You know, well, how many are you up to now? At this time? So okay, so we are up to fifty five or sixty people now, and so it's in a very short space of time, isn't it? Yes, it is. And as a you know, absorbing, onboarding, you know, organizing people at that that pace. 
you know, in a compressed period of time, what have been some of the challenges of doing that? Yeah, so one of the amazing things that happened is that, uh, about eight or nine months after I joined, we hired at our headquarters a new president uh, for our CRO go-to-market, a guy named Dolly, and he's super smart and uh, the best sales leader I've ever seen. And he's put together a whole program of go-to-market and training, and he understands Japan's a huge market, so we're getting a lot of, um, a lot of um, investment here. Um, I have a new boss. He's the head of um, Asia. His name's Kaneda-san. So they did an interesting thing. The head of Asia is actually based in Japan. Very sharp Japanese guy who uh, understands what I'm doing, which is good. So we get along very, very well. And like I said, he understands the, the, the Silicon Valley way. But um, so we, yeah, I think the excitement of the company is one thing. So we have a great technology, but then on top of it, we have great processes, great people. It's really, really hard to get into Zscaler. You have to pass a lot of interviews. And there's people that I've brought up right to the end of the interview process, and someone senior will reject them. So it's to get in, every, it's, everyone's talented. So it's a luxury to work there because whoever you're dealing with is a very talented person. So and it's how really. Does someone who's presumably sitting outside of Japan make a decision on staff in Japan with any context that they can actually understand what they're getting. Because Japanese, to a, a great extent, are probably the world's worst interviewees. They don't know how to sell themselves. They're quite humble. You know, my good work should shine through and people should appreciate what I've done. But, you, you, you know, so I wonder in that sort of interview process, maybe they're not seeing the worth of people, I wonder. Yeah, uh, so... Sometimes there's an education process that comes along, and luckily uh, the senior management at Zscaler is pretty open-minded, and so they've, they've learned that Japan is a tricky market to hire in. Uh, a couple times we've lost really good people where on the Japan team we know this guy is going to succeed if he joins, but maybe he doesn't come across as dynamic, but for sure he's going to succeed, and then he'll go up, oh, this guy's not dynamic, reject it, get, get us some more rock stars. It's like... Geez, we're losing it. I mean, we know this guy's going to succeed, and everyone in Japan knows this. So that, that can be a little bit painful, but that's, that also, we've also been saved by maybe putting up people that weren't A-level just to fill seats and then getting them rejected too. So um, there is an education that goes on where you have to educate, you know, because as you know, Japanese people, you ask them, are you, oh, you played baseball in college where you go, oh, I really wasn't that good. You exactly. Find out, like, the guy was like the best. Where you ask someone in America, oh, you played the guitar, oh, I'm really, really good. And, you know, the guy's average, right? So it, it, there's this, um, yeah. and, and same, it's interesting because I think same with me where if you look at, let's say if you took a, not, not Zscaler, but it's generally speaking in the IT world, if you look at a senior vice president of sales in America, usually there's some soup or Australia, super macho, you know, and you're like... Whereas that's not the skill that a sales leader in Japan has to have because no. you, you can't manage Japanese people that way. So I think... So what I'm, do you think uh, is a skill for a successful this, sales manager in Japan then? Yeah, this is going to be a crazy thing to say, but the ability to speak slowly and clearly mm. is... I, I was on a call yesterday with a guy from Australia who was on a call with my, my team and Afterwards, I wrote him a, a Slack. I said, that was great. You spoke so slowly and clearly. Thank you. And he's like, wow, great. I'm, I, you know, because, um, you know, you get on these calls yeah. and I've, I've had calls with like people in India, like talking to Japanese customers and I'm like, slow down. And they're yeah. like, no, no, I only have 10 minutes. I want to get all this done. I'm like, you're no. confusing them. And so, um, so, okay, let me see. I think, um, I think, you know, slowly and clearly, uh, but also um, patience. You got to have patience, to, mm -hmm. as you know, because so many things in this country don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so if every little thing that doesn't make sense bothered you, you would go crazy. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like coming back with quarantine now. You know, mm -hmm. you get tested, you get tested again, you get tested, and then you're in quarantine for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So my wife's Japanese. I said, this, she said, it has nothing to do with coronavirus. It's all about following the rules. You know, it's like mm -hmm. the whole process is there to follow the rules, not to help with coronavirus. So, yeah. so um, I think being patient is important. But then you, you have to be here to really understand the psyche mm -hmm. of Japanese people because... Mm -hmm. Again, I've, I've seen all these sales leaders come in and they talk about commissions. And if you join Zscaler or you join ABC Company, you're going to make commissions, commissions, commissions. And a lot of times with Japanese people, it's more, 
more than making a million yen commission. It's more, if the, if the head of the company brings them up in front of everyone and says, everybody, Tanaka-san went through this really long sales cycle and he closed this big customer, everyone clap for him, yay. That guy's gonna be happier to have everyone in the company clap for him. And they say, you know what, we're not gonna be able to pay you that commission because of this, where it's gonna go to the US teams. Okay, okay, as long as everyone clap for me and they know I closed the deal, you know, so. Just that psyche of... But even that sometimes, you know, uh, you've probably seen this too. Uh, someone you'd like to promote. Yeah. And they reject the promotion offer. They say, oh, no, 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 I need another two, three years of experience before I can step up into that role. Or you'll want to bring them up to the front and, you know, acknowledge them, celebrate them. And they're, no, 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 no. Because they're worried about getting stabbed in the back by their mm. colleagues who are jealous. Yeah. And people are going to talk badly about them. So they don't want to – some people it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there are others who are like, no way. I don't yeah. – let's have a – you know, if we have a private lunch together, yeah. very happy. But in front of the group, no thank you. Whereas others, yeah, maybe it's okay. So you've really got to understand, I think, what the individual yes. is going to respond best to. Yeah. I, I think in the companies I've been at, no one's really worried about getting stabbed in the back. I think maybe like uh, bigger companies or like an NTT or NEC. Or, but um, I, I, I'm happy if people reject a promotion or mm. want to question it. Because you don't have, you know, it's not for everybody, right? Mm, that's true. And so when I talk to younger or older Japanese sales people, Almost so I said, what is, your, what is your dream? What is your career goals? I want to be a manager. I hear that so many times, but they don't know why they want to be a manager, right? Mm -hmm. But if someone said, I have, a, I have a guy now working for me, great sales guy, and um, we talked about his career path. He goes, I don't want to be a manager. It's like, okay, well, why not? I was a manager 10 years ago. I had to manage people. I didn't like it at all, and I just I want to close deals. And so now we're talking about maybe like a special, because he's really, really good, like a specialty role where he could help out a lot of different salespeople but not be their manager. But I, I if, you know, so many people think like, okay, oh, the next path is manager. And they, they never question it. They just take mm -hmm. it. So if someone's so going to analyze it and think, I don't want it, then I think that's a good thing, you know. Yeah. And so uh, how many people now are you up to? The company is up to, in Japan, almost 60 people now. And you said it's going to go to how many very shortly? A double of that, probably. In what space of time? In over, a little over a year or so. Wow. Or, yeah. That's, again, more absorption of a lot of uh, talent coming in and, you know, trying to get them to on board. And yeah. So how, how do you enculturate them? How do you get them into the Z-scale of culture once yeah, they join? Yeah, well, we... Yeah, we have a great onboarding process. We, it's the most professional company I've ever been at. So we, our, on, our um, sales enablement team and sales operations, they're like super professional. I would never recommend any company, you know, grow this fast. But if, but, you know, if anyone's going to do it and, and succeed, I think the way we're doing it is the best way. And I think, you know, we, we will succeed. And so, and what, we're hiring concretely local people. concretely, though? What, how do they do it? What, are they, what have they found that works well to have that rapid scaling up? I know yeah. the name's Scaler in the company, but what are they doing with people to get them to come well, we, up to we, speed? We have a set process. So what we do is we hire for um, intelligence and coachability. Mm -hmm. So maybe people don't have the experience, but if they're smart mm -hmm. and they're coachable, they can learn our system. So we have a very good system where we, we learn the customer's needs from day one. So even before we have that first meeting, we've already gone through and we've put down what we think their business is, where their challenges are, and we bring that up in the first meeting. And so, um, you know, most Japanese sales guys, the way the sales go, it's like they go there, they talk about their product, the customer says, we want a quote, they do a quote, we want to do a trial, okay, we'll get you a trial. And the sales guy never even learns what the company does or what their pain is, right? So from the first meeting, we talk to the customer like, Mr. Customer, we put this together. Maybe this doesn't fit, but this is how, you know, we really wanted to understand your business before this first meeting. So we researched on the internet, is this right? And a lot of times, oh, this is different or that different. And then, you know, it was funny. We were, I was on a call with the CIO of a, a big Japanese company here, and we did that. And we, I didn't know he was such a cantankerous kind of a crazy guy. So we put this together. This is how we see your business. No, 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 that's all wrong. You got it wrong. And, and we spent the next 30 minutes with the CIO going over all of their initiatives and what they're doing. And after the first meeting, we had a whole list of everything he cared about and everything that was important in all of their roadmap. And we didn't talk about the product that much, but we ended up getting more meetings. And so that was 
I was like, this process works, you know? And so, I mean, you gotta, so the Zscaler, we have a, our, our training, we, we learn about the customer, we have, you know, different milestones where we do architecture workshops and, you know, TCO type things. And we identify not just- What's a TCO? Uh, you know, uh, total cost of ownership or, you know, um, we call it business value assessment because- Lifetime value of the client. Lifetime. And, and, and so <clears throat> with our business, you know, we're moving people to the cloud. Mm -hmm. So they say, oh, my God, Zscaler is expensive. No, it's not, because once you move to the cloud, you can get rid of all that hardware you had. Mm -hmm. You can lower your bandwidth costs. So, yeah. you know, if they just want to remove one little piece, then Zscaler is going to look expensive. But if they want to go down the path of true digital transformation, the true ability to have all of their workers be able to work remotely from anywhere they are at any time and be a real digital company, then we're probably going to be able to give a much better you know, much better security, much better user experience at a lower cost once they buy in. So, so you've got a good, you've got a good product to sell. So for the sales team, that's a big advantage. And one of the things that it's huge. You, it's you huge. know, often in Japan, the the salespeople will go in with a pitch, yeah. and it's all about the spec. Yeah. You know, and what you're talking about is starting with need. Yes. And that in itself is not typical because it's usually the other way around. It's like. They don't know what you need, but they t start telling you what they've got yeah. and hope that somewhere there's a match. Yeah. Well, you're starting from the other direction of what's yeah. the need. And then if you've got that match, then you just uh, you just talk about that and we're on the right discussion. So right. the, the well, principles are correct. Yes. And what, what's interesting is always – so it's funny. Like I said, you know, I, I have a new boss from, you know, eight months ago, nine months ago. But when we first brought this – new sales process back, so many of the Japanese guys said, oh, we, we can't do that here because this is Japan, right? So eventually everyone began to buy into it and learn it works, right? But the, the great thing is, with, you know, my new boss, he's as a Japanese, he just came and said, we're doing this process, we're doing it 100%, instead of saying we got to tweak it or whatever, and it, and it works, and so it doesn't matter. And, and so we, we go through this process. So that's really how we're able to scale our business, is we have a great sales process, everyone follows it, everyone knows their role, and we bring new people in, we train them, they follow it, and uh, we have a great ecosystem, we have solution architects and evangelists and all these different people we bring in at different times. And when you have good people and they understand the system and there is a good system and you have the best product in the marketplace, then uh, miracles can happen and that's really what we're achieving here. And probably that reluctance, uh, initial reluctance anyway, to do it that way is because the buyers have been trained to get a pitch. Yes. And so, you know, if you start interrogating a buyer and they don't really know you, you know, they're yeah. like, who, who are you? to be asking me questions, you know. So you've got to set it up. You've got to yeah. get permission to ask them questions yes. to be able to help them. But most Japanese salespeople don't have that step. Yeah. Therefore, they never get into the questioning model. They're sort of yeah. stuck at the spec model. Yeah. And it's a, a complete waste of time, you know. We've all had these experiences of someone selling us. And I remember a guy came in, it was a software product. He sat down. Up comes the uh, laptop, 60 slides, boom, 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 boom. You know, we teach sales training. I'm sitting there thinking, I wonder when this guy's going to ask me a question. Wow. Nothing. To yeah. the very end. And I just sat there. I didn't say anything, you know. Yeah. So he's completely flustered. Yeah. But uh, well, what did you think? And I said, well, slide 39. Could you go back? And there were like two slides in that deck of 60 that were relevant to me. Yeah. If he'd asked me some questions about my business and our needs and what were required, he would have deleted 58 slides and gone straight to 39 and whatever number yeah. the other one was. But that's, that doesn't happen here in a lot of companies' cases. So it's good that your company's got a, a process of starting with needs. But come back to leadership here and talking about what have you found uh, in terms of getting creativity out of the team? What have you found has been working well? They sound like the hiring process is going to make sure they're very engaged because they've come through a very you know difficult yes. entry point. But what about getting creativity? How do you um, get creativity out of your team? Yes. So we have a lot of team meeting. We, we meet as a team every week mm. and we talk about a lot of different things. And I let the, we do it, we'll do it in English at times and then move into Japanese and just let all the Japanese talk. And so I, I'm just super open. I remember uh, at Oracle, at Net, when I got to NetSuite, I hired this young 
Japanese female who was very good worker. She was like 26, and she moved from Oracle to NetSuite, and she'd been working for me like two months. And I would, you know, like I said, I hired all these people, and everything's new. And I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her, and I said to her, I said, what advice do you have for me? She's like, what do you mean? What? Ah. And it's like, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. Am I, do you see me doing anything wrong? Any advice? And she was just shocked. She couldn't believe, you know, I was a 26-year-old girl, and I was, whatever, 50-something. And I'm, whatever, you know, she just couldn't believe it. And she was, like, mm -hmm. frozen, you know, didn't even know what to think. But I think... Um, <laughs> And that's really what I see as the worst part of Japanese management is when you have these bucho or people that don't want anyone to even ask them a question. Like, I'm the god here. I tell everyone what to do. So mm -hmm. I think we have a, a really open uh, culture where, you know, even with my boss or three bosses above me, you know, if it's in Japan, we're going to do ABC. I can say, you know what? A is never going to work. B maybe can work. And C will work if we tweak it, you know, and everyone wants to hear, which is good. So I think um, and they're open to that feedback. Yeah. And so, again, I, I want to write another book now about Japanese succeeding in foreign companies. And I've written a bunch of articles. Well, on talk it. about your book. I mean, well, that's another book. So have you got a copy with you? By I, I do. Yeah. But, um, but going on to this other book is, um, you know, how Japanese succeed in foreign companies. And I think that's really, really interesting. So I, that'll be my next book. But this well, is what my, about this book? What's this this is my first book. This is a new one, right? Yeah, this is called Mind Over Sales. That's it's, right. And you're doing a talk on that at the American Chamber I next am. week, isn't it? In on Tuesday morning. Yeah. So I'm actually be, practicing for that tomorrow. There. Thank you. Thank you. So basically, this, this, about? So this, this was uh, like 25 years of ideas that, that were in my mind. And... Um, you know, there's this mindfulness movement now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, going back, I, I started like doing, you know, fasting and meditation and all, you know, trying to learn about Tai Chi and yoga and all this stuff 25, 30 years ago. And I was like the freak then, you know. And so if I would have gone into a job interview 25 years ago and said, oh, what are your hobbies? I like to do meditation. Like, well, we can't hire this guy. He's going to be staring against the wall. We want aggressive people. But what happened was in, over in, in interviews like the last 10 years, for example, my interview with Oracle, I mean, I, I mentioned I do meditation early on and it was like I almost got the job right there because the, the Dutch guy I was talking about said, wow, Darren, when you mentioned you do meditation, I felt there was a vulnerability there that I could trust you. And um, then in Oracle, I helped set up this um, mindfulness program that we copied after the, the, the Google book, I think Search Inside Yourself. And uh, there was a lot of stressed out people in Oracle. And every Thursday morning, we had like a group where we'd teach them how to meditate. And, and it was really interesting to, to see all the different people come through. So I think, um, the mar luckily for me, the market's coming to where I am. Because I was always this, I won't say, you know, I, I was always someone who's more on the spiritual side. And kind well, give, of, us the, give us the teaser yeah. on the book. What's, the, what's the, sure. the teaser for us to get the book? Sure. I, what's um, it about? Good. So I think here, here's one. Here's one example. So um, less is more. Mm -hmm. So there's in the West, it's like you ask someone, what kind of what kind of meal do you want? I want a big steak. No mm -hmm. one ever says good. It's just big. You know, I want a big and you eat a big, huge hunk of meat and it's got to digest. It's like it, it's crazy. Right. So in Japan, it's like quality over quantity. You know, mm -hmm. the meals are smaller, but the food's like so high quality. Right. Mm -hmm. So. In the workplace, less is more. So if you were with a customer, as you said, if you talk less, the customer can talk more. Less exactly, is more. Yeah. Um, when I was at Verizon, I was reporting to um, this, this woman who was all the words she used were fight and push and fight and push. Oh, you got to talk to our operations. You got to push them to do this. You got to fight with them to do that. And after I was reporting to her for a couple of months, I said, why don't I just go to them and explain to them why we need this and why this makes sense? And why do I have to fight with them? Yeah. She's no, 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 no. They won't understand. So I'll put it this way. So here's one concept. Less is more is let's say you have a problem. And if you have a Western boss, what actions are you taking? And if you said, I'm not taking any actions. What do you mean you're not taking any? And screaming at you, right? So, okay, there's a problem. You have five choices, five actions you can take. Well, number six, you could do nothing. And a lot of times, if you do nothing, the problem resolves itself. Or the people working on it fix it themselves. And so I, I love um, Phil Jackson, who was the coach of the Chicago Bulls mm -hmm. and the Lakers, you know, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. And when he was at the Bulls, I was, you know, living in Chicago when he started coaching and my aunt and uncle had tickets and I was a huge fan. I didn't know he wasn't the Zen master famous guy he is now, but I'm watching him coach. And 
in basketball, when your team is in trouble, you call timeout to stop it, regroup, and then go back. And his team would get in trouble, and they, he wouldn't call timeout, and they would go <laughs> fall further and further behind. And one of the reporters said, asked him after the game, they're like, why don't you call timeout? And he said, you know what? Sometimes the players got to figure it out for themselves. And I thought, wow. Because, mm -hmm. and they're out there on the court. They have, now they have this mindset, like, the coach might not bail us out. We got to learn how to do this. And so I think the concept of, you know, always having to take action, always having to talk, always, you know, sometimes less is more. So that's kind of um, one of the concepts. I think, um, you know, another one is the misconceptions around the book, The Art of War. So I, I, I'm mm -hmm. a huge fan of The Art of War. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of The Art of War is to never fight. Because mm -hmm. once you start fighting, let's say it's a real war, and let's say, you know, the book was written in China, you start fighting the, other, the opposition and killing their people. Once you take them over, how happy are they going to be to join your team, right? Mm -hmm. So the greatest generals in history were the ones that won through diplomacy and got what they wanted without crushing the other side. And you never heard of these people. The people that had the big battles and won them most likely weren't the greatest generals that ever lived. So mm -hmm. the whole, I, but you have to understand war in, in real war, the workplace, because people are going to try to attack you. And you always have to be on the lookout for who's going to do that. But if you use, you know, if you don't fight back, so you know some of the people that I've worked that have worked for me, they try to fight with me, and sometimes they'll write me nasty emails, and I'll just write back, "Thank you for your insight," you know, and and so they're swinging at me, but if I don't swing back, mm -hmm. then no there is target. no fight, and then they get tired of swinging, and then mm -hmm. they change and they realize that there's a different way to do it. So I think um, this is really you know some of the things I've learned in. Japan and Asia over the last 20, 25 years of uh, removing conflict, increasing teamwork, and then also motivating people without, um, you know, the easiest way to motivate people is through fear. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if you guys, the bottom 20% of the people, we're going to have to let them go after the end of this year, you got to sell. If you, if you threaten someone to fire them, to, to sell, they're going to be motivated to sell, but it's a very negative motivation. Yeah. And so it's, I guess it's the concept of creating a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was, I was, um, in a job in a, in, in a review fairly recently, I was, um, someone said, Darren, you're too nice. Like you're not, you, you don't beat up your team. You're too nice. And I said, this is how I manage. And I explained it and I explained some of the concepts in the book. And I said, you know what? Everyone on my team works hard. And in the review, everyone respects me. And I said, I can't, over the last several years, I can't even pick one person who hasn't worked hard. You know, everyone I have is given 100%. And so I, I would rather, I don't have to be their best buddy. I don't think you have to be their best friend. You have to be their manager or their leader. But again, if you're able to motivate positively, that's the highest level of motivation and the hardest way to get to. And um, so a lot of those concepts are are in this book. But then again, you think of the population, you know. I've worked for bosses who've ruled through fear. And people like me who are self-starters, self-motivated, very independent, you deal with it. But most people don't deal with it, and it just destroys their motivation and mm. destroys their work. So this sort of idea that you can whip people and make them work harder through a sense of you're going to lose your job or whatever. I think particularly in a country like Japan is very short-sighted. So I think what you're talking about is much more in, in harmony with the culture mm. here and also the work culture here. And I think getting more out of people through, well, Dale Carnegie, it's all about praise, appreciation, human relations principles. That's exactly what we believe too. And we see the, we see the difference. So it's good that you're, you're bringing right. these things together. And it's interesting because it all comes back to me now because I, I, I have a dedication here in the beginning and it starts with my parents and it ends with uh, Leroy Norby, a special thing. He was my grandfather hmm. and he was different from everyone in my family and he had this great library and he had some of Dale Carnegie's books and he had uh, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow mm -hmm. Rich. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid, I read that mm -hmm. and no one else in my family and he would go to the desert and do yoga and fasting and all this crazy stuff and he had this great library. And that was really what started me when I was, mm. before I was even 10 years old, reading all those books. And mm. I think Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, as a little kid reading that book, that really it's a caught classic. my, that, that it's a one was the one that made me realize, yeah. um, you know, 
intention and thoughts have mm. power and knowing mm. where you're going. So. Mm. so if we were going to give some advice, apart from, of course, buy your book and read it, apart from mm. that obvious advice, if we're going to give some advice to someone who is going to be coming to Japan to run an organization here, they don't know Japan, they don't speak the language, what advice would you give them? Uh, I, I, yeah. First, for someone coming in, uh, be patient. And uh, so I live next to Seisen International School. And next to us, there's Sakura House, this like 18 giant Western homes. And there's a ton of German families living there. And there were two very senior German executives who came in. One was running BMW, one was running a pharmaceutical company. And they both, their first year, they were frustrated. And the second year, the guy running BMW said, you know what, I've learned to just, I set the direction and the Japanese have their own system and I just let them do it their own way and I get out of their way and the results have been great. Where the other guy kept trying to fight it and after two years, he's like, they do everything wrong. And they, they do do everything wrong, but it, it works, it works here. And so I think the, the first one is to be patient. And I've, I've seen, you know, when I was in Oracle, I was with a very senior guy who flew in and we had a meeting with a really, really senior guy at one of these Japanese companies. I won't say the name, but it was one of the Hitachi NEC type companies. And it was like this, the CEO of the company. And this Oracle guy came in and told him everything wrong with Japan. Mm. Like mm, okay. Japan's not going to, because of this, this, this. And the Japanese senior executive just kind of blew the guy off. And the, this German guy from Oracle was like, oh, this is so terrible. They're not going to change. And, Afterwards, I thought, all right, well, here's a country that's been around 2,000 years and some guy from Germany flies in and tells them they're doing everything wrong. I don't think they're going to change. I think, you know, so I think Japan's successful. When you look around the world, there's not a country as successful in Japan in so many ways. So to come here and think you're going to change Japan, it's not going to work. You can't change Japan. That's the first thing. So you got to learn to work within the system. Mm -hmm. Then... What I always tell these senior executives is my story to the Japanese people is Japan's not different. And my story to the people overseas is Japan's very different. And what I mean by that is, for example, the sales process we have at Zscaler, we're going to do that process. In Jap well, it won't work in Japan. All right, well, maybe we've got to tweak one or two little things, but this is, this is the process. It works everywhere. It's going to work here. So what I don't want to do is keep changing everything for the Japanese staff. But for the staff over, you know, the senior executives overseas, they need to realize what works, the sales process in America or Australia or UK, it's not going to work here exactly the way it is. And so I've seen a lot of people get in trouble where they're like, we're going to do it the US way and you're going to stop doing sales the Japanese way. So I think being patient, understanding the market, understanding there's a lot of success here and you got to work within the system. And then probably finding some people inside the organization that, that get it, you know. So um, there's going to be some... Uh, you know, some Japanese people who speak English who want to change the company or understand the Western way. And one of the things that I, I want to put into my next book is, um, you know, there are some Japanese executives here who speak English very well, but they still don't want to buy into the Western way. They're like, oh, no, no, we can't do that because this is Japan. And that, that was, um, you know, how I got my job at Zscaler originally was one of the slides I had in my interview was dream big. And so I didn't know this until after I was two months in the company. Someone asked my boss at the time, why did you hire Darren? He said, well, we had interviewed 23 Japanese people, and they were all trying to lower the bar. And Darren said, this is going to be 20 times bigger. we got to dream big. And so that concept of, of dream big. And so and it, it is interesting with Japanese staff. I think to, to have that really positive attitude goes a long way because there's an inherent feeling in Japan of negativity or something. I mean, this is a country that gets, you know, there's earthquakes and tsunamis and nuclear meltdowns and, you know, Godzilla and all, all these things coming at it, right? So there's kind of this feeling something bad's going to happen at times. And so, you know, for example, at Zscaler, they, you know, my, when I first joined that, we're going to double this, we're going to double the quota for next year, which we, 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 surpassed but all this oh we you got to go tell them we're not going to be able to double we can't double right or we're going to double the size of the company. oh we can't hire that fast so my answer is always a very very confident i believe 100 percent we're going to be able to hit this target i believe 100 percent. and then when you have that confidence suddenly everyone around you has that confidence so i think um yeah be understand the market find your allies inside the company be patient have a very positive attitude because there's going to be kind of a you know, it's not going to work, 
but I believe it's going to work, and we've seen this in Actually, I, I've been talking about that. I do have a funny story when I was at Vodafone of um, someone who, uh, there was a guy, a Portuguese guy who was, had a lot of success at Vodafone headquarters and they flew him here for product. And I was on the product team, obviously. And um, he said to the head of the messaging team, I want to launch this product in Japan. It's been a success all, all over Europe. I don't even want to take time to study it or do market research. And if it fails, that's fine. I don't care. I just want to do it quickly. So let's launch this thing. I want to plan within 10 days. So this is a Western guy who didn't know Japan, who's tasked to doing this, and he put his best engineer on it. And a week later, he's like, okay, let's see your plan. And the Japanese guy put together three pages of why it won't work. No, oh, right. Yeah. That was and, the have, plan. and now we have three days to go before we're presenting to this, you know, it's a very senior Portuguese guy. It's like, no, 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 you got to go back. We're going to re review this in two days, so go back and make a plan. So the Japanese engineer went back. Now we had four pages why it won't work. Now we had one day to go. So he's like, just, you guys don't understand. It's not going to work. So um, there's a lot of, uh, and then again, those the, are. The difference there is the Portuguese guy was prepared to fail. Yeah. Well, in Japan, right. no defects, yes. no errors, no You're mistakes. So, right. so Perfect. how could you culturally get them to imagine we're going to go ahead and try something and if it fails it's okay it's like no yeah. maybe failure is not an option in japan right right so that was culturally at the extremes yeah. right yeah and i i wasn't in charge of that project i was watching it as a teammate inside yeah. and i'm sure we explained it to this guy who was actually a genius engineer but well i think the 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 key point would have been uh, you have no responsibility for this success or failure, yeah. zero. Yeah. Crazy Gaijin wants to try it. He's gonna take all the accountability, all the responsibility. We're gonna test it in the real market. And he said, if it fails, he's accountable. We're all scot-free, let's go for it. We've got nothing to lose because it's all on him. If you've got that mentality, then probably you're thinking, all right, okay, I'll give it a go. But if you're thinking as normal, I'm responsible for this launch. I have some skin in the game here. It's going to look bad on me. It's going to look bad for the company. It's going to be bad for our, our clients. Here's my fifth page of why it won't work, you know. So I guess, I mean, should the, uh, should the new entrants here coming to Japan to run a company, should they learn Japanese? Yes, they should. And they'll never, obviously never become fluent. But even knowing like 20 or 30 words, it makes a huge difference. You know, I, and I've seen Japanese people get so happy. Um, and so making an effort, it, you know, the people that learn 0%, it, the people that learn 50 words compared to the, word, the ones that learn zero words, it makes a difference. And people in the company feel it. And they feel like um, this guy's trying to really understand Japan. He wants to understand. And then you, you begin to learn the nuances of these simple words like, you know, shogunai or mm. gambaru or, mm -hmm. you know, so yes. Wakarimasen. I, wakarimasen. So just yeah. realize it's going to be frustrating. You're going to hit a, you're going to hit a wall. You're never going to be fluent. You're never going to run your meetings in Japanese, but definitely learning some Japanese mm -hmm. will help you. It'll be, it'll, it'll be interesting. And the team will respect it and like it, and then it'll be good. So yes, I would say to spend a little time studying. And what would Japanese. be your your definition of leadership, Darren? How would you describe leadership? Um, I guess one of it is trust. If mm -hmm. uh, people don't, if you don't trust someone, it's impossible to lead them. Mm -hmm. Especially, you always hear that term. You know, would you follow this guy into battle? Mm -hmm. And so I've worked with people where it's like. I would follow that guy in the battle, and other, I wouldn't follow this guy anywhere. So I think a lot of it comes down to uh, trust is mm -hmm. the first thing, and um, really understanding the other person and what mm -hmm. makes them tick. And luck, luckily for me, I'm a people person, mm -hmm. and so I, I like people. I, I find them interesting, mm -hmm. um, and. It, and one of the things in my book is, you know, focus on your strength. So I ignored that part for years because I, I thought I'm naturally a people person. I don't need to work on that. Mm. And so I was focused on improving my numbers, you know, forecasting mm -hmm. and Excel. And now mm -hmm. I, I got that up to a decent level. Mm -hmm. And all, I was working on my weaknesses. And then I was listening to a guy named Stuart Wilde. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know him, English guy, kind of a crazy philosopher from the 80s and 90s. Really smart guy. And he said, focus on your focus on your strengths and all your weaknesses fall away. It was like mm -hmm. a sentence. I thought, wow. 
So then I decided to really focus on my people skills too. So focusing on my, your strengths is important. So um, I think, you know, once I identified that, you know, because I like people and um, really, so it comes down to uh, leadership trust and, you know, having that communication. And then also people buy into what they help create. Mm -hmm. So getting everyone's input on something. And mm -hmm. I'm always super transparent on everything. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when we have to reshuffle all the accounts, what I don't want to do is just, OK, here's yours. Mm -hmm. You know, so I have them all out there. This is what, you know, this guy, this, this lady, this boom, boom. And everyone sees it because what I don't want to do is have everyone think I'm secretly doing things. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, um, transparency mm -hmm. where people don't think you're hiding something because mm -hmm. then they're not going to trust that leadership, too. Mm -hmm. So I think those are all things that have that have helped me mm -hmm. kind of lead teams. Very good. Well, Darren, thank you very much for joining me. It's been fascinating. Good. A very potted history there of the last 30 years. been great, but uh, some highlights, too, and interesting insights that you've brought to us. So thank you for that. Thank you. So join us again for our next episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews.